Okay, it is partial differential equations time. Uh, any questions before we start? Hi, Professor. Uh, can you do the from page uh, 25 uh, number one? I guess I can some dot. Logan, this is the number. Logan, the second, second right. Quarter. So I haven't even started to talk about that section yet. That's what I'm going to do today. So let me discuss the conservation laws, and then okay. we'll go back okay. and look at that. Okay. Okay. So what I want to cover today, from the Applied Partial Differential Equations book of Logan, is section. 1.2 on conservation laws. Um, my conservation laws and are called our characteristic coordinates. So this section begins with a very interesting discussion of what a conservation law, what a simple conservation law is. And you can express it as, uh, you can start to think about it as follows. So you have some, oh, let's think of it maybe as a tube, but the only relevant spatial dimension is X. So whatever it is, it's everything is homogeneous to any cross section of the tube. And suppose we take the cross section, let's say from A to B, and we wanna say something about how the amount of material, whatever it might be, physical or something, you know, uh, energy of one sort or another, changes from time T1 to time T2. So let's say that um, the amount So we have the amount at time T1, and we have the amount of material in this tube at a later time, time T2. And actually, I want to know how the cha change. So let's think of this as, what is the change from the amount of time T1 to the amount of time T2? So you have the amount of time T2 minus the amount of time T1. And it's going to consist of, so we're looking at not the amount that's in the tube, but the difference through some small time interval. So what can we say? This is the, um, in this time interval, we have this time interval, delta T from T2 to T1. In this time interval, we have the amount that goes in, minus the amount that goes out, right? So in this region of the tube, from time T1 to time T2, a certain amount might go in and a certain amount might go out. You also might have not material going in or coming out, but a certain amount that's created inside the tube. And you might have a certain amount that's destroyed inside the tube. So that is some measure of the difference in the amount of material in the tube. Now, we can either look at the amount of material or um, 
the amount per unit volume, the density. So the amount at time T1 is, um, let's say the density at time T1 times the volume of the tube. And the amount of time T2 is the density at time T2 times the volume. And we let our state function, our function U of XT be the density at position X at time T. So, yeah. But this is the whole idea of the conservation law that If you want to measure the change in the quantity of material from one time to another time, that's this difference, the, the change in the amount. It's the amount that goes in minus the amount that goes out, plus the amount that's created inside minus the amount that's destroyed inside. Um, what does it mean, for example, to talk about the amount that's destroyed inside? Suppose you had some volume of material and nothing was going in or going out, but it was some radioactive substance. You have a container of uranium. And over a period of time, some of the uranium decays. That means some of the, some of the uranium is destroyed. So the amount would decrease from time T1 to time T2 because a certain amount of the uranium inside the tube was destroyed. So that's a way to think about this uh, picture. Now, if we want to look at these quantities as um, something like densities, like the quantity per unit volume. So um, we could divide by the volume, the volume of the part of the tube. And so we get something which looks like this. So so u of x t is the density at time t. So suppose we have a little piece of tube of thickness dx, let's say the area, this cross-sectional area is equal to A. So the amount of material in this little piece of tube will be the density times the area or times the volume. The volume is the area times the thickness. And if we're interested in so we think of this as in the tube from A to B, we take the interval from A to B, we divide it up into little pieces, compute this and add it up. That's exactly what we call an integral. That's the integral from A to B of U of X T A DX. So this is the amount of material in the tube at time t. Now, what about the amount going in and the amount going out? So let's say let, so this is what is called the flux. 
So the flux is a function um, phi of x t, and flux is a measurement of how fast material is moving into the tube at a given point. So So let's say, I mean, try and describe it in words. So flux is the, um, this is the amount of material crossing the tube at X at time T. Per unit area. So for example, so if here we have this tube from A to B, the amount going into the tube at A is at a given time, this is going to be phi of AT times the area. So this is the amount of, of material going in at time A. Uh, if you're going, it could be positive or negative. What's the amount of material going in at the other end of the tube? It's going to be minus, because this is our positive direction, it's going to be minus A phi of BT. Phi of BT is the amount going out at position B which means minus that is the amount going in. If it's negative, it means stuff is leaving. So the flux through this piece of tube is given by this. What about what is being created or destroyed inside the tube? So we let f of x t, be the um, rate at which material is being created or destroyed in the in the tube at x at time t per unit area. So so in a small piece of the tube of width dx and the area is a the rate at which material is being created or destroyed is a f of x t dx this is the volume And if we take the interval from A to B in the tube and divide it up into little pieces and add them up, that's exactly the integral from A to B of f of x t dx. So, so we have the following, the, the integral from A to B of u of x t a dx is the amount of material in the, in the tube at time t. We have that A phi of A t minus V of BT, this is the flux. This is the rate 
by which material enters the tube. Keeping in mind that when we say enter, it could be a negative sign here. It could be a net loss. Right? So this is the rate at which material enters the tube. And A, integral from A to B of F of X T dx is the rate at which material is created in the tube. If, if this has a positive sign, we think of the tube as a source. And if this has a negative time, we think of it as a sink. So the rate of change, the rate at which material, uh, the, the rate at which, so rate at which material in the tube changes is A times V of A T minus V of B T plus A times the integral of F of X T DX from A to B. This is the amount of material at time T in the two, the total amount. The rate of change of this is the derivative with respect to T of the integral from A to B of U of X T DX times A. So this is the equation in on page 13, number 1.7, which is a fundamental conservation law. All it says is just what you understand, the rate of which some material in a space is changing is um, the rate at which material is entering plus the rate at which is being created. Okay. So there's the rate at which stuff comes in and goes out, the rate of which stuff is created and destroyed. That's the, that's the rate of change of the quantity. That's this. Okay. Any questions about this? So this is a, um, I don't know, it's not a kind of philosophical discussion, but it gives you some understanding of where equations that you deal with in PDE come from. Now, now we can use some calculus. So So if the function u has continuous partial derivatives So this is something you learn in advanced calculus. You can interchange differentiation and integration. That the derivative with respect to t, a times the integral from a to b of u of x t dx is a times the integral from a to b, the partial derivative of u with respect to t dx. So if u has continuous first partial derivatives, you can interchange differentiation and integration. Okay. Notice when you integrate this with respect to x, you get a function of t, and this is just the usual derivative of a function of t. When you take the derivative operator inside, this is a function of x and t, so here you're taking a partial derivative. So that's our first observation from advanced calculus. We have a second observation from freshman calculus. Okay. 
says the following. If the function phi has continuous first partial derivatives, then phi of a comma t minus phi of b comma t, that's minus phi of b comma t minus phi of a comma t. I just took out a minus sign. This is minus the integral from a to b of the derivative of phi with respect to x, parcel of phi with respect to x at x t dx. Uh, minus the integral from a to b phi x. That means the partial phi with respect to x dx. That's just a nicer, more concise way of writing that. So if I take these two expressions in their integral form, and I go back to my conservation equation, of course, I can cancel the a's. So I get the integral from a to b of partial of u with respect to t equals minus the integral from a to b partial of phi with respect to x plus the integral from a to b of f of x t dx. And if I bring everything over from the right side to the left side, I get the integral from a to b of the partial of u with respect to t. See, so notice these are all integrals from a to b with respect to the variable x. So this is the partial of u with respect to t plus the partial of phi with respect to x minus the integral of f of x t dx equals zero. Now, you understand this as follows. Suppose we have this extremely long tube. It can be even infinitely long. And we take a segment of the tube from A to B. So this integral is zero. And the integral is zero for all A and B. And so this is true for all a less than b. And if you learn calculus appropriately, freshman calculus, if the integral, I mean, if this function, this is, this is all, all of these partial derivatives are continuous. What we have inside the integral sign is a continuous function. It's a continuous function. If at some point it's different from zero, Let's say for some particular x and t, this is positive. If it's positive for some x and t, then it's positive in some interval around x and t, which means you can find some a and b where this function is positive for, uh, from everywhere between a and b. In that case, the integral is positive, not zero, which tells us that this thing can never be different from zero. So this says that ut plus phi x minus f of x t equals zero for all x and t. We can think of x as going from minus infinity to infinity and t from some point starting at zero. Or another way of writing this is partial view with respect to t 
plus the partial phi with respect to x is this function f. So u is the density of material in the tube, phi is the flux, and f is this operator which tells us at what rate material inside the tube is being created or destroyed. This is our conservation equation. Uh, write it down uh, again. Uh, professor, can you repeat the last expression, the, the real meaning? Sorry? Can you repeat the, the meaning of that expression? Right. So mm -hmm. this is our fundamental conservation equation. You have U is the density function. It's the amount of material, it's the density of material at position X at time T, that's U. And this is the partial derivative. Phi is the flux. Phi tells us the rate at which material is moving across the tube at position X at time T. So this is the density of material. This is the flux. And this is what is sometimes called the source, source or sink. This tells us something about the rate at which material is being created or destroyed. So this is our fundamental conservation relation. And when we think of this, we think of this, the function f is being given. It's like an inhomogeneous equation. The function f is being given and we wanna find u and phi to satisfy this equation. And in the simplest case, and it's the very important case, which is called advection, which is a word that you don't need to know, but it is the word. So in this case, the flux is proportional the flux. is proportional to the flux phi is proportional to the density u. That means that there's some number c that phi of x t is some constant c times u of x t. And in that case, if we plug it into this equation, what we get is u sub t plus phi is Cu, so we differentiate phi with respect to x means we're differentiating u with respect to x equals f. And if the source function f is zero, then we have the following differential partial differential equation, u t plus c u sub x equals zero. So this is a first order differential equation, right? The equation we've looked at most is a diffusion equation, which involves a second derivative. This equation involves only a first, the first derivatives. We have an unknown function u and the partial of u with respect to t, that's the first derivative. Partial of u with respect to x is the second derivative. And we have this relation. Now, a general solution of this equation is very easy to write down. And it's as follows. 
let f be any differentiable function of one variable. And let's define u of xt to be equal to f evaluated at the number x minus ct. I claim for any differentiable function f, this is a solution of the partial differential equation. And all we need is the chain rule from freshman calculus. What is the partial of u with respect to x? It's the partial of f with respect to x. That's f prime and x minus ct times the derivative of x, which is one. What's the partial of u with respect to t? Well, you take this function, when you differentiate with respect to t by the chain rule, this is f prime evaluated at x minus ct times the derivative of x minus ct with respect to t, which is minus c. So we have u sub x equals f prime, u sub t is minus c f prime, so u sub t plus c u sub x is minus c f prime plus c f prime is zero. Wow. So this partial differential equation has an unbelievably vast array of solutions. And these solutions have a very simple geometrical picture because we have that u of xt is f of x minus ct. So for example, what is u of x zero? It's f of x. So, f of x is some function. What is u of x at time one? It's f of x minus c. What does the graph of that look like? Well, if you have f of x and you replace x by x minus c, what does that do? It translates the function c units to the right. What is u of x at time two? It's f of x minus two c. It's the same function translated another c units to the right. So we have that what are called right traveling waves. At any time t, this function u of x t, which gives the density is a certain curve. And as you go from t to t prime, all you do is you translate the curve to the right by an amount t prime minus t times c. It's exactly the same shape. Same shape. Mm 
Now, suppose we're given an initial value problem. for this equation, which is called the advection equation. Namely, so we have this partial differential equation for x from minus infinity to plus infinity and t positive. And we have an initial condition that at time zero, u of x zero is just some function, u zero of x. So if we take this to be our function, f of x, then we can let u of x t be f of x minus c t, that's u zero of x minus c t. This is the solution of the dif partial differential equation, which satisfies the initial condition. Because when t equals zero, we get u zero. Uh, professor, uh, when you write the big f, the big F is the integration. Wait, or, I'm sorry. What uh, What are you asking? Yeah, the the final expression you put the big F is an integration. This right here. Mm -hmm. F that big F is not a, a capital letter F. Means is the integration. You're talking about the integration of that function with respect to. Um, X. So I have no idea what you're referring to. So. Yeah, yeah, no. So are you looking at? Uh, so yeah, tell me what you're referring to. Yeah, when you write the expression u to the x to t equal big F times x minus c t, the big F, the capital letter. Right uh, here. Uh, yes, you yes. referring to the integration? No, there's no integration. Okay, okay. I don't see an integral sign there. No, I'm saying we have an initial value problem. We have the advection equation. We have this first order partial differential equation in x and t. And it's defined for all x from minus infinity to infinity and all t greater than or equal to zero. And we have an initial condition that the solution has to satisfy, namely that u at x zero is some given function u naught of x. And what I said is, if we let, think of u naught of x as some function capital F of x, I already showed that for any function F of x, F of x minus ct is the solution of this differential equation. So let F be u naught, so u of x t equal to this, solves the differential equation and it solves the initial condition. That's what I said. Okay. Now, I wanna make it a little bit more interesting. So this was a very simple equation. Um, ut plus cux equals zero. And I want to consider
an equation of the form. So before I had ut plus cux equals zero. Now I want to consider a source function. I want to have au equal some f of x t. And I'm interested in solving equations of this form. And to do that, I have to recall one fact from Calc 3, where you looked at functions of several variables. So you might have had some region in R2 and some function to the real line. So you have some function z equals f of x, y. So for every pair of points x, y in this region, you go to some number z. But then you might want to evaluate this function just on some curve in this region. So on some interval on the line, we might have a curve or maybe alpha. So for every number t, so this is from the real line into R2, alpha of t is some point, x of t, y of t in this region. So we have an interval and a function from, this is interval in the real line into the plane, traces out a curve. But then you can evaluate the function just on that curve. So we have the following composite function from here to here to here, where t goes to f goes to x of t, y of t. And then this is under this function alpha. And then this goes to f of x of t, y of t. So we have this composite function. We start with a real number. We end up with a real number. Right? This is just a function of t. And what the chain rule says is the derivative with respect to t of this function f of x of t comma y of t So we have a curve in the plane and a function defined on that curve. And the composite is a function from that sends a real number to a real number. It's a function only of t. This is the partial of f with respect to x, dx dt plus the partial of f with respect to y, dy dt. So this is the chain rule uh, or well, chain rule is works for functions from one space to another. And this is a very special case, All right? Just to make sure you understand something about this, let's see, suppose alpha of t is the function t squared t cubed. So alpha is a function from r to r2. And we have a function from r2 to r given by um, f of x, y equals um, I don't know, I'll make it interesting sine of x, y times e to the x. So use the chain rule to compute the derivative of f composed with alpha of t. Right. So spend a minute or two to recollect some calculus.
T squared, I just want to make it a little, T squared comma T cubed. So this was alpha of t is t squared t cubed, f of xy, sine of xy times e to the x. So the derivative with respect to T of F composed with alpha of T partial F with respect to X dx dt partial F with respect to Y dy dt. What are X and Y? X of T is T squared So, so dx dt is 2t, y of t is t cubed, so dy dt is 3t squared. This is f of xy. Partial of f with respect to x is Let's see, cosine of xy times y times e to the x plus sine of xy e to the x. And the partial of f respect to y is x times the cosine of xy e to the y. So what we get is that the derivative with respect to t of f composed with alpha of t is the partial of f with respect to x plus the sine of x, y, e to the x times 2t plus partial f with respect to y times dy dt. Let's see, y is t cubed, cosine of xy, xy is t to the fifth, e to the x plus the sine of x, y, e to the t squared times 2t plus x t squared cosine of x, y, e to the y times 3t squared so 3t squared times t squared makes this 3t to the fourth. So if this is correct, 
Let's see if we can check. Suppose we write f of x of t, y of t directly as a function of t. This is the sine of x, y, t to the fifth, e to the t squared. Let me just call this capital F of t. Well, sorry, so that's F composed with alpha of t. So the derivative with respect to t of F composed with alpha of t is also equal to five t to the fourth sine of t to the fifth e to the t squared. Oops, I'm sure I made a mistake somewhere, but we'll see. Plus, oops, sorry, uh, differentiate this. Sine of five t to the fourth cosine of t to the fifth e to the t squared plus sine of t to the fifth, the derivative of e to the t squared is 2t e to the t squared. So this is 5t to the fourth cosine of t to the fifth plus 2t sine of t to the fifth times e to the t squared. Let's see. Um, so what do I get over here? The derivative of f composed with x, derivative of f with respect to x, that's y cosine xy e to the x plus the sine of xy e to the x and partial of f with respect to y is x cosine of xy e to the x. So I have y cosine xy e to the x plus sine of xy e to the x times dx dt, which is 2t, plus x cosine xy e to the x. Always good to check. Times 3t squared. So this is t cubed cosine t to the fifth e to the t squared plus 2t sine of t to the fifth e to the t squared plus 3t squared times t squared, 3t to the fourth cosine of t to the fifth. So what I have is 2t sine of t to the fifth e to the t squared. And I have 3t to the fourth, and I should have, this should be two to the, so why is this wrong? Um, oh, times 2t. So I had to multiply y times 2t makes this 2t to the fourth. <coughs> right, perfect. So that checks. Uh, always good to get the calculus right. So this is, um, well, I mean, it's, it's just a calculation that you need to be able to do using the chain rule. Right? Are there any questions about this? You should have seen this in Calc 3, which is a prerequisite, the only prerequisite really for this class. Okay. So let's go back to the problem at hand. We want to consider a more general first order differential equation. U sub t plus c u sub x. C is a constant plus a u, a is a constant, equals some function f of x t. 
And we use a um, technique called the method of characteristics or the introduction of characteristic coordinates. Method of characteristics. And what this does is it reduces a partial differential equation to an ordinary differential equation. And we'll be able to solve the ordinary differential equation and it's like a miracle and we can solve this. So the method of characteristics reduces a, P, a, a PDE in two variables to an ODE in one variable. And the new coordinates we introduce are the following. So these are so-called characteristic coordinates. We let C, it's a Greek letter, be equal X minus CT and tau equal to T. Remember we saw how X minus CT played a central role in just the simple equation UT plus CUX equals zero. So remember we start with a function that we're trying to find U of XT. Well, What's the relationship between the new variables and the old variables? X is C plus C T, which is tau, and T is tau. So this gives us a new function. So that's called, this is a function I'll call it capital U of C and tau. which is, so this is the same as capital U of X minus CT and T. So this is how we go back and forth from the old coordinate system XT to this new coordinate system C and tau. And I went to, so in my partial differential equation, I have the partial of U with respect to T and the partial of U with respect to X. I want to get the partial of these new functions, capital U and capital C, with respect to the new variables. So So u sub t, this is the partial of u with respect to T. This is the partial of capital U of C and tau with respect to T. By the chain rule, this is the partial of U with respect to C times the C dt plus the partial of u with respect to tau, d tau dt. So that's the chain rule. So u sub t equals the partial of u with respect to xc, dxc dt. Differentiate this with respect to t, you get minus c plus the partial of u with respect to tau, d tau dt is one. So this is minus c u sub xc plus u tau. And what is the partial of u with respect to x? Yeah. 
consciousness, the partial of you, capital U with respect to X, which is the partial of you with respect to C, the C DX, plus the partial of you with respect to tau, D tau DX. This is U sub tau, partial of U with respect to tau, D C DX, this is C. You differentiate this with respect to X, you get one plus the partial of u, sorry, this is c, plus the partial of u with respect to tau, d tau dx. Well, there's no x here. You differentiate this with respect to x, you get zero. So this is just u c. Sorry. Um, yeah, u c. So let me just write these down so I don't forget them. I have, for my original function u, u sub x is, yeah, use c. And the partial of u with respect to t is minus c u c plus u tau. So what is my differential equation? Remember my differential equation was u t plus c u sub x plus a u equals f of x t. This becomes u c plus c u sub x, sorry, u sub t u sub t is minus c u c plus u tau plus c u sub x. plus a u equals f of c tau. And these terms cancel. So I just get the partial view with respect to tau plus a u equals f of c and tau. There's only one partial derivative. This is an ordinary differential equation in the variable tau. C is a parameter. So if I can solve the ordinary differential equation, I can, I've solved the partial differential equation. So let's look at an example. So in the notes or in the book by Logan, let me do example 1.9. We have the PDE partial U with respect to T plus two times the partial of U with respect to X minus U equals T. So C is equal to two a is equal to minus one and f of x t is equal to t. So this tra equation transforms into this equation. This equation is u with partial of u with respect to tau plus 
AU minus U equals T, tau. So here is my partial differential equation and it gets transformed into this differential equation. It's a first order non-homogeneous differential equation. We know how to solve it. For example, let me do it on a clean piece of paper. So I started with this PDE, partial view with respect to T, plus two times the partial view with respect to X, minus U equals T. And when I change variables, so my C is X minus CT, so C is equal to two and tau is equal to T. These were my new coordinates. I get the equation U tau minus U equals tau. So if I multiply through by E to the minus tau, U tau minus E to the minus tau U, equals tau e to the minus tau. And what I have on the left-hand side is the derivative with respect to tau of e to the minus tau u. Okay. So when I differentiate this by the product rule, I get e to the minus tau u tau minus e to the minus tau u. So e to the minus tau u is the integral of tau e to the minus tau d tau. Let's see, I can integrate that by parts. If I have tau e to the minus tau minus e to the minus tau and one, I get this is equal to minus tau e to the minus tau plus the integral of e to the minus tau d tau, which is minus tau e to the minus tau minus e to the minus tau. So this is exactly minus one plus tau e to the minus tau, plus a constant with respect to tau, some function g of c. So, a solution of the ordinary differential equation is u of c tau equals minus one, I multiply through by e to the tau, that cancels this, plus g of c e to the tau. And remember, when we made the change of variables, C equals this and tau equals this, capital U of C tau was little u of xt. So we get u of xt is minus one plus t, plus g of c, which is x minus two t, e to the t.
for every function g. Now, you really need to spend some time over the five days to our next class going through this beginning part of um, the section in Logan because uh, there are two new ideas in this. One is um, this notion of a general conservation equation where the rate of change in the density uh, is, is related through the equation to the flux and the source function. And the other is this remarkable technique that reduces a partial differential equation in two variables to an ordinary differential equation in one variable. So of course this helps only if you can solve the ordinary differential equation but typically that's easier to do than to solve a partial differential equation. Let's just check, by the way, that this solution works. Check. So I have to compute what? I have to compute, let's see, what was my original equation? Um, u sub t plus two u sub x minus u, let me calculate that. When I differentiate this with respect to t, minus one minus t gives me minus one. When I differentiate this with respect to t by the chain rule, I get minus two g prime at x minus two t e to the t plus g of x minus two t e to the t. That's u sub t plus two times the derivative with respect to x, the derivative of this with respect to x is zero, the derivative of this with respect to x is g prime of x minus two t e to the t minus u, so minus this makes this plus one plus t minus g of x minus two t e to the t. So this term and this term cancel. And this term and this term cancel. And the minus one and the plus one cancel. And the only thing left is T. So that is what is technically called a miracle, if you like. But we managed to solve this partial differential equation by the method of characteristics, getting an ordinary differential equation. Yeah. It worked. Um, professor, there's one observation. In PDEs, uh, we didn't use uh, in the, uh, more than one independent variable. So the advantage to reduce the PDE to ODEs, the most important independent variable is in that case is time? No, it depends on the problem. Oh, okay. No, I, I mean, it just depends on the problem. It's not that in general, one is more important than the other. It's completely dependent on the problem. Okay. Okay. All right, I think I'm actually going to stop now because I wanna do one or two more examples, but you can't do an example in less than half an hour, I think. So um, So I will modify the homework assignment a bit for Monday because I didn't cover as much as 
uh, I had hoped or thought I would abstractly, but um, and I will try to uh, 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 come up with some not infinitely complicated problems that involve separation of variables and also some problems that involve um, this method of characteristics, uh, which is really very interesting. Okay. Um, also, um, I have office hours, which no one ever attends or very few people attend. I have an office hour sometime on Friday. I have to double check the time, but I will email that out. Um, that just means there's a Zoom session. And if you have some questions, you can just zoom into the office hour and we can talk about whatever problem you might have. So that's important to know. Okay. Um, there are a couple of topics. We have a, a second exam coming up in about three weeks. And um, there's definitely one additional topic we haven't discussed yet, which uh, I will cover before the, that second midterm. And that is the Laplace transform. Uh, so if you took a course in ordinary differential equations, you might have learned the method of Laplace transform to solve an ordinary differential equation. And uh, the same Laplace transform can be used to solve partial differential equations. Uh, so that is what we will also be doing uh, some, sometime next week. Okay, well, good. If there are no questions, I will be available on Friday and we have class again on Monday. Uh, everyone take care. Take care. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye.